Secretary of State Michael Gove in the House of Commons in January this year. The guidance is co-authored by Professor David Mosey of the King's College London Centre of Construction Law with Russell Pointer Brown of On Pole Limited and the DL, DLUHC Procurement Advisory Group. Now, the Centre of Construction Law is part of our Dixon Poon School of Law at King's. You can see a picture of the uh, building which it's housed in front of you. Uh, and, and it's been led by Professor Mosey since 2013. The centre is committed to research and support for the construction sector that has a direct impact on the society in which we live, including the development and demonstration of procurement and contracting systems that improve economic, social and environmental value and that reduce risks. And today's guidance is the latest in a series of important reports and publications from the Centre over almost a decade now. In 2014, the Centre developed and published Cabinet uh, Office guidance on early contractor involvement and supply chain collaboration and mentoring multiple trial projects. 2016 saw the development, publication and trialling of the FAC1 and TAC1 collaborative contract forms now used on procurements worth over 90 billion pounds. And in 2021, Professor Mosey's independent review of public sector construction frameworks in collaboration with 120 industry representatives led to constructing the gold standard, setting out 24 recommendations for improved practices, which the government have committed to adopt and implement. Now, I know that Professor Mosey will be known to all of you for his work over the last 20 years, including two widely respected books on collab collaborative procurement, and we look forward to hearing his remarks later this afternoon. Along with a range of important speakers on this most important of topics, he will set out what makes this guidance distinctive and crucially, its potential impact in ensuring that we never again witness a tragedy such as we saw at Grenfell Tower. So my congratulations to everyone involved in developing and publishing this important guidance. And I wish you all an informative and a fruitful afternoon. I'm going to hand over now to Professor Mosey, who will introduce today's keynote speaker and the rest of the programme. Deborah, thank you very much indeed. And uh, very much appreciate you giving us your time and indeed your influence in the House of Lords. Uh, in support of this initiative. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I know more delegates are joining all the time, which is very good to see. Um, a moment of housekeeping. Uh, for you to participate in this event, uh, you're muted and you'll remain muted as delegates uh, because we have many hundreds of people, but you can type your questions and comments in the chat column. Uh, everybody can read them. Uh, some speakers may type your written answer. I will moderate uh, some of the questions um, and hopefully cover all of them. We have two question and answer sessions um, uh, during the afternoon. I'll, I'll run you through the full programme uh, after our keynote speaker has, has, has addressed us. Um, uh, and we do want to hear from you, of course. This is, a ver this is guidance uh, that is practical. It's not theoretical. It is in the hope and expectation that you will want to adopt it. So clearly, we, we would like your views. Um, but before I speak any further, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, someone who has uh, produced, frankly, probably the most inde important independent review uh, of my career, um, not the one she would have wished to produce, um, but she is author of, of Building a Safer Future, the independent review of building regulations and fire safety that was prompted by the Grenfell Tower disaster. So Dame Judith Hackett, is, is going to be well known to you for that, but you should also know that she is an engineer, um, that for 10 years she was chair of the health and safety executive, that she's currently chair of MAKE, who are a manufacturing trade body, and of the uh, cross-industry safety steering group. Uh, she has great practical and professional knowledge, uh, but she's also uh, devoted her, her time and her authority to seeking to improve the protection of uh, residents and other occupants of buildings. I will hand over now uh, to Dame Judith Hackett. Judith, thank you so much. David, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. 
it is indeed a pleasure to be supporting this launch today of the guidance on collaborative procurement for design and construction. There's no doubt at all in my mind that driving the right culture to deliver safe buildings has to start at the very beginning of any project. In my review of building regulations and fire safety, I stated there that improving the procurement process will play a large part in setting the tone for any construction project, because this is where the drive for quality and safe outcomes, rather than lowest cost, must start. And I have to say that my opinion hasn't changed over the last four years. In fact, I've become even more convinced of the importance of collaboration being set up from the point of procurement as a result of what I've seen and heard as chair of the Industry Safety Steering Group. I'm delighted that two of my colleagues from that ISSG, Paul Nash and John Cole, who you'll hear from later, have been part of the procurement advisory group, which has given strong support to the production of this guidance. The guidance sets out how collaborative procurement really hinges on four key elements. Selection by value, not simply price, to avoid that setup of an inevitable race to the bottom if everything is driven by price. Secondly, early supply chain involvement to improve safety and reduce risk. Thirdly, collaborative relationships which involve residents who are so important in this process and which deliver on commitments. And fourthly, the golden thread of information that integrates design, construction, and provides that all important record of what is built to ensure continued safety in operation throughout the lifetime of a building. To many of us, this isn't rocket science by any means. It is basic common sense that these are the prerequisites of success. But I'm also aware that for many in this sector, the built environment that is, it is a significant shift in thinking. I was very pleased to be able to show my support for this guidance by providing the forward, not just because I believe the principles are right, but because the guidance itself and the way it is written is both practical and smart. It provides real life examples of projects where collabor collaborative procurement has been displayed and the benefits which have flown from, flowed from that. It provides models and practical advice which can be readily adopted to deliver that collaborative procurement. But perhaps most importantly of all, this guidance links with what is in the new regulatory framework and also in other important initiatives like the construction playbook. The guidance has been designed to help key players in the system to achieve compliance, and to help them meet multiple objectives at the same time. So a lot of care has been taken to ensure that it fits. I'm particularly pleased to see the way in which the guidance has been correlated with the key gateways, which the building safety regulator will deploy on all buildings in scope under the new regulation. At this point, I want to make particular reference to one example of where I particularly welcome some of the detail in the guidance. And this is not to say this is any more important than any other aspect, but just one example for me. The guidance is very clear in stating that retention policies in contracts which withhold payment to those in the supply chain are totally inconsistent with pro collaborative procurement. I said very much the same thing in the final report of my review four years ago. Retentions do not encourage a focus on building safety. What is surprising is that people still question me on what I meant by that and how there can be a link between payment retentions and building safety. 
I understand that in theory, you could put together an argument that by withholding payment, one is encouraging the supply chain to act responsibly and to do a quality job in order to receive full payment. The problem, of course, is that this is not how it works in practice, and we all know that. In a world where margins are tight, where payment terms are often very slow, and cash flow is a common killer off of many businesses, what actually happens in practice is that the suppliers assume they will never receive their cash pay, their retention payments. And if they do, it will be a bonus. And so therefore, from the outset of projects with retentions involved, they are looking for other ways to cut costs, cut corners, and save money in whatever way possible. That means not investing in training, not caring about competence, substituting substandard or even non-compliant materials. That is the reality of why retentions should not be part of collaborative procurement if we are committed to delivering safe outcomes. And as I've said, that is why I commend the clarity in this report on that very subject. So we're now just a few weeks away from the Building Safety Bill receiving royal assent. There can be absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind that there is a need for change and that the time for taking action is long overdue. Just like with competence frameworks and many other aspects of what is needed to deliver the change that is required, here again with this guidance, we have an excellent example of dedicated people putting their, putting their minds and their wealth of experience in to provide help and assistance to industry to deliver that change. The new regulators, both the building safety regulator and the construction products regulator, will demand these new behaviours. There is no excuse for waiting to be told what is required by them when others have already clearly laid it out for you. But only you in industry can implement this. The action now lies with industry, and by that I mean all parts of the built environment, to deliver. I would very much like to see the building safety regulator give strong endorsement to this guidance to provide added impetus. But please, let's see some leadership from you in any event. These changes are needed and they're needed now. And I commend this guidance to you. Thank you. Dame Judith, thank you very much. Now, I'm pleased to say that Dame Judith is able to stay with us at least till the end of the first session. So she will participate in, in question uh, and answer. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, uh, Francis, um, and indeed the one after that. Um, uh, let's look at the afternoon ahead. We're, this is a very succinct session. People are under strict limits. After I've spoken, you will hear from Professor John Cole on how should the construction industry implement the guidance. There will then be the first Q&A at just before three o'clock, uh, followed by Beth Dunning of the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, looking at how the guidance can support the building safety regulator, followed by a session on client leadership from Martin Cawthorne of L and Q, and a session from Katie Saunders of Trows and Hamlins on how procurement and legal advisors should implement the guidance. And finally, a session from John Welsh of Crown Commercial Service on how we can implement the guidance through frameworks. You'll then have a quarter to four, uh, a second Q&A session, and we will wrap up at four o'clock or, or before that as, as need be. So I hope that we will give you some stimulation on how this guidance is different uh, from anything else that has been produced over the years. There's been an awful lot of guidance on intelligent collaborative procurement practices. Um, I will illustrate in, in my presentation uh, why I think this is different, but you will hear from a range of very experienced professionals uh, as regards their perspective. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so what is different about this guidance? Uh, to the next one, please. 
Um, firstly, what do we mean by collaborative procurement? I lecture master's students, I lecture at industry events, and people very happily sail off into a vague and idealistic discussion of good faith, generally other people changing their behaviours while we can remain the same because we obviously behave in good faith and others don't. Um, that is not what this guidance relates to. There is no discussion of good faith, there's no discussion of idealistic concepts. This is practical guidance, it is not aspirational or theoretical. And one of the things I will talk about mostly in this presentation is are the direct links to gateway questions under the Building Safety Bill. Um, so the structure of the guidance starts with those questions, it summarises key points of collaborative procurement, and then it goes through the sections that Dave Judith has referred to, the uh, need for balanced evaluation to avoid a race to the bottom, not only in terms of the processes and criteria of evaluation, but also the measures of competency and Dame Judith's ISSG, um, as well as the Construction Industry Council, have done a great deal of work in this space. So we're getting the right people as well as the right organisations. Um, there's a section then on early supply chain involvement, which is now mandated by the construction playbook on a comply or explain basis. And in my view, uh, not a moment too soon because I see that as a crucial pre-construction phase interlude during which we can agree and adopt improved safety practices that improve value and reduce risk. There is a session, section on team integration and on fair practices, and this, this brings absolutely to life Dame Judith's point about commercial practices influencing behaviours. So there is a section on fair payment and profitability, because if we don't pay fairly and enable profitable projects, we will have people who cut corners, and cutting corners is very, very dangerous. Um, there's, that section also looks at decision making on value and risk issues, at joint risk management, which is a clear process. The idea that risk is there to be chucked over the fence or chucked down the supply chain is uh, a crude and inaccurate assessment of how to deal with risk. Joint risk management is a legitimate and, and proven process. And there is a part there that looks at resident consultation in terms of recognising their status in the team and in the consultative process and running a communication strategy that brings them on board. Um, there is then a section on, on BIM and the digital golden thread, which uh, has been recommended with early supply chain involvement and collaboration since 2011. There was a government construction strategy 11 years ago on this, um, but it's also a proven medium for understanding uh, and, and uh, implementing whole life approaches that integrate design, construction and operation. Um, then the remaining sections, looking at how we sustain and enhance a collaborative culture, pick up the themes of leadership, of cost models and incentivization, of early warning to avoid disputes, and of the emerging options in relation to insurance. Section 10 looks at strategic collaboration, and, and John Welsh will be talking about that later this afternoon. Uh, uh, Deborah, Baroness Deborah Bull referenced my work on constructing the gold standard, which is uh, an independent review of public sector construction frameworks. There are other ways of uh, implementing strategic collaboration, but it clearly has an impact on health and safety because it enables us to learn from one project to the next and not to be on that groundhog day of starting again. Um, section 11 is the point that we have to combine improved safety with other improved value, whether that's net zero carbon, whether it's economic value or social initiatives. And finally, we look at something that Dame Judith mentioned in her report, the need to learn lessons from other industries through our collaborative techniques. So that is the overview. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, and why is it essential? Dame Judith has said this very, very eloquently today and also in her report that um, while we have, um, and if I was preaching to the choir, you know, of course there are many, many examples in the housing sector of excellent collaborative practices. But strangely, there are many examples of what Dame Judith called indifference, where the primary motivation is to do things as quickly and cheaply as possible, rather than to deliver quality homes which are safe for people to live in. And as she has said today, improving the procurement process plays a large part in setting the tone for any construction project. It's where the drive 
for quality and good outcomes rather than lowest costs must start and it kickstarts behaviours that then run all the way through design, construction, occupation and maintenance. Next slide, please. Um, now, this guidance has got off to a good start. It was announced by Michael Gove in the House of Commons on 10th January, where he stated we're today publishing new collaborative procurement guidance on removing the incentives for industry to cut corners and to help the prioritisation of cost over value. Very clear. Um, as as uh, Deborah Bull said, uh, Russell Pointer Brown and I drafted this guidance, but we had enormous help and support from the DLUHC Procurement Advisory Group, uh, including representatives of Actuate UK, the Association of Passive Fire Protection, CIOB, CIPS, Constructing Excellence, Crown Commercial Service, Lingwood Management Services, L and Q, Meter Squared, RIBA, RICS, Sharp Fibre. Trials and Hamlins and World Commerce and Contracting. And we also ran through a series of case studies. I won't list them uh, for lack of time, but it's to give you the sense that we're looking at real collaborative housing procurement projects that have delivered real benefits, not only in terms of health and safety, but also in terms of other measures of value improvement and risk reduction. This is not theoretical, it is based on evidence. Next slide, please. But I've been working on collaborative procurement initiatives for 24 years now, uh, and it just amazes me how very well established principles and evidence can slip into the Bermuda Triangle, the collaborative Bermuda Triangle of idealistic debate, cynical criticism, and unrealized good intentions. Uh, it's very, very frustrating. And I'm going to speak now about how we can avoid that happening in relation to this guidance. Next slide, please, Francis. Um, it is through the links to the Building Safety Bill. This introduces the stringent new regulations for the design and construction of high risk buildings and includes three gateways at the planning application stage, at the building control stage before construction can begin, and at completion and handover before occupation. And these are very important. Um, they give um, an opportunity for the building safety regulator to understand whether the team are ready. This is all of the duty holders, the client, the principal designer, the principal contractor, and everyone working with them. Are they ready to proceed and have they addressed health and safety issues? So it's no surprise that, that the guidance emphasizes how collaborative procurement and contracting systems can be linked to those gateways expressly um, so that we can support the work of the building safety regulator. Um, this is where a lot of our efforts have lain. Um, we're not prescribing contract forms. We're not narrowing down people's options. Uh, we understand that private and public sector clients go about their work in different ways, but we have created what we believe are universal and proven collaborative systems and processes are directly linked to the gateway questions that will form part of the building safety regulators work. Next please. Now bear with me please through these slides. These are not jazzy slides, these are what questions will be asked if the building safety regulator follows our suggestions. So at planning application stage, have the client's processes for identifying who creates the fire statement and who prepares the planning application, have they demonstrated a balanced approach to value and evidence of suitable competencies? We start in avoiding the lowest cost approach right at the beginning. Have the contract terms for those professionals stated integrated commitments to safety and quality compliance? in accordance with their agreed rules. We've got to start at the beginning. We can't think that pre-planning, it's sufficiently vague for people not to be fully committed to follow through on their safety and quality obligations. And of the client's selection process and contract terms for these professionals preparing the planning application made clear their capabilities and commitments to use digital information management tools. I have to say, and I've practiced before I was an academic, in the housing sector for many years, and I have the highest respect for the work of housing organisations. 
but I do not understand why BIM has made so little inroads into the work of so many housing associations. Um, we have to start, and that's true of private developers as well, we have to start at the beginning if we're going to get the benefits of digital information management. Next slide, please. So we move to gateway two, building control before construction can begin, and we start looking at the procurement of our principal designer, principal contractor, and other professionals, preparing a building control application, which includes, as we know, plans, construction control plan, fire and emergency file, other supporting documents, have those procurement processes demonstrated a balanced approach to value and evidence of skills, knowledge, experience, and behaviors. The devil is in the detail in terms of how those criteria are expressed, how those competencies are proven. But it, we've got, again, to get away from lowest price and get away from um, short circuiting, a very important selection process. And the one that I consider utterly crucial, has that approach to procurement used early supply chain involvement? I do not understand how any architect or engineer or client or project manager can think it is legitimate to delay appointment of the main contractor and of the supply chain members until the last possible moment. Uh, not only is that essential as an early appointment essential to look at their contributions to improve safety and quality, it's also important to de-risk the project for the professionals who started out the design process. Um, needless to say, for the residents who will inhabit the completed project. So that early supply chain involvement to me is no longer an option. It is a proven and legitimate way of getting away from a race to the bottom. Next slide, please. And at the same gateway, um, have we got clear legal obligations expressed by our duty holders? We, we, we're going to have regulatory obligations, but they should have contractual obligations as well. Um, uh, within their agreed roles to ensure safety and quality compliance and again demonstrate their capabilities and commitments to use suitable digital information management tools. This is, this is as I say, very, very straightforward stuff. As Dame Judith said, it is not rocket science. It is um, something that we should all be doing. Um, and just because it doesn't have bells and whistles on it um, doesn't make it any less important. This is what you can use in your procurement process and your contracts. Um, and to me, it is not counterintuitive or in any way objectionable, but it is something that the building safety regulator can see. Next slide, please. Um, here we get into something really important. Um, the involvement of residents and the involvement of consultation. Um, we cannot do everything by instruction through a good project manager. Some things are authoritative, but some things are necessary, necessarily collaborative. And risk management is a difficult science. So, you, so is design development for that matter. So we need to see a proper contractual collaborative system for consultation between professionals and with residents, where, where residents are available, as it were, and applicable. Um, there are circumstances where uh, we're, we're, we're not dealing with residents because, because, because this is starting from scratch. But that is, that is really, really important. The, it, it, we're not islands. We're um, obligated collectively to comply with these regulations. And then we want a transparent way of making decisions um, so that we agree the Gateway 2 application within our agreed roles and contributions um, and can therefore demonstrate uh, that we've worked together and made intelligent decisions uh, as to safety and quality compliance. Next one, please. Um, there is uh, a question that arises between gateways two and three, because there is an ongoing process here. Um, we've got our uh, on site, we have the approvals to go on site, we have the relationships and the appointments and the digital information management uh, that enable our work, but we need clearly to regularly consult with each other um, during the construction period to implement the approved construction control plan, to update, to maintain and implement change management, to monitor and update the accuracy of our digital information management, and to ensure safety, quality and regulatory compliance, including site controls and change controls. And by this stage, I hope that many of you are saying, 
what's the big deal? We do this anyway, which is great. That's all I need to know, because if you really are doing it, then you're in a position to show the building safety regulator how you have dealt with health and safety in the right way through your procurement and your contracts. Um, and you're not just being called upon to make empty representations um, on fundamental health and safety issues. Triangulating this should be second nature, and I'm sure it is to many people on this call. Next one, please. And we come to the end now. Gateway three, completion and handover before occupation. And we want again to see a collaborative system followed through. I've seen a lot of collaboration done pre-construction, which then converts into a very master and servant approach to delivery. And um, retentions, as Dame Judith described, being the way to exercise leverage over people as if everybody didn't want to complete a good project. Um, we want a collaborative approach to completing our Gateway 3 application. We want our as-built plans and other prescribed documents signed off by all parties. And we want to see regular engagement with residents in the run-up to that process as well. And we want an integrated system uh, to confirm among duty holders the safety quality and regulatory compliance before work is covered up during construction. This is not a single shot. Um, and before work is handed over on completion. Um, and then, of course, we're handing over to an operator outside the scope of this guidance, but we want to see that the golden thread of information for the completed building um, has been handed over to that operator and that the client has demonstrated how their procurement achieves this. So next slide, please, and we will come to a close. Um, I hope you have been able to bear with me. I've seen questions coming up in the chat column that I will look at later. But what I hope I've demonstrated is this is not guidance uh, of the type you've seen before. Um, excellent though that previous guidance is, exhortations from a lot of people to do exactly these things. This guidance differs, firstly because it's driven by horrible necessity. Um, and you will hear a lot from John Cole on that subject in case we've forgotten. Um, but also because we can link it directly to the building safety gateways. And to my mind, after all these years of watching highly successful collaborative projects and watching failure of non-collaborative projects, to my mind this is essential for not only the pioneers and the good guys to adopt this approach, but everybody, the reluctant people, the people who are bored by consultation and just say, oh, for heaven's sake, price it and move on. Um, that's not good enough. We need this to be widely adopted and we need the guidance not to be lost in the Bermuda Triangle. So that is me done. And I'm now going to, if I can have the next slide, please, um, hand over to someone who, as Dame Judith says, sits on the industry uh, steering group, the industry safety steering group, and is a very eminent architect. Um, John Cole, Professor John Cole, CBE, um, is currently procurement champion for the RIBA. He's a past president of the Royal Society of Ulster Architects. Uh, he's a past chief executive of, of the health, um, ah, I can't remember, it's, it's, it's a health agency in, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, he is professor at Queen's University in Belfast as part of their School of Planning, Architecture and Engineering. Um, and he has taken a close and uh, highly uh, analytical view of health and safety issues um, arising out of the Grenfell Tower disaster. And I'm very, very pleased that he's able to join us today. John, I hand over to you. Thank you, David, for, uh, for that. Um, next slide, please. Um, today, really, what I'm talking about is the challenge to the, to the industry that we all belong to. Next slide. Um, this is a headline from the Times last year, uh, David Aronovich, who's to blame for our shoddy building culture, an industry riddled with corner cutting as possible only because so many of us try to get our homes built on the cheap. Next. In that uh, article, David referred to another article written in the Times by Robert Lee. Bad practices are embedded deep with an unsustainably long and poorly configured supply chain of subcontractors failing to survive on razor thin margins. In general, there's a race to the bottom in quality and standards. So the path to Granville 
was all there in plain sight and we slept our way through its development. A bit of an indictment for the industry. And in July 2014, this is what happened. Next. We've got failures in materials, failures in cavity barriers, failures in compartmentation, failures in compliant design, and a building that had only one means of escape. Next. Next. We have 72 people died, 70 were injured, hundreds if not thousands of lives were affected. And the question I think we have to ask as an industry is, who was responsible for looking after quality and who is responsible for looking after quality? Next. This is a, 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 one of three fires, which I'm just going to show very briefly. Uh, in June, this is in June 2019, where a fire in a single flat led to the destruction of a whole block, this, in this case, 20 flats next. And this block next of 23 flats ended up looking like this when one caught fire. And this is the cube in Bolton student residence uh, where the fire shot up the, the planning system, very similar to Granville. And I was lucky no one lost their lives in, in any of these fires. Next. Um, they're still happening, the 90 story apartment in New Province Wharf in London in May last year. And we'll all have seen a recent fire in a similar building in that area of London. Next. And this isn't new. The industry for a long time has been failing in this particular area of fire protection um, and compartmentation. Um, these are headlines from 2015 about schools built by one of the major contractors uh, having major safety issues. Next. These are hospitals, uh, PFI hospitals, um, uh, right across England. And uh, the bottom heading there, I'll just talk about that one. There are fears over safety standards at all PFI hospitals after fire officials find others in Hereford and Peterborough were built without fireproofing. So an, an issue that has been going on for some time and somehow or other, we have missed this as an industry next. Uh, in Ireland, um, the house in the middle here caught fire and uh, within an hour, six houses were burned to the ground because of lack of fire stopping between the houses. Again, it happened during the day and nobody was killed, but so many people could have been. Next. These are slides from a, a, an independent inquiry I chaired in Scotland uh, into major failures in, in a large events building. Um, and these, what you're looking at, uh, are holes in compartment walls or compartment floors um, in a building built by a tier one contractor. Next. Same building and just shows that these buildings were approved, signed off by quality assurance systems of builders and the others involved and by building control. And yet these photographs were taken six years after the buildings were completed and uh, the building was had to be virtually knocked down and rebuilt and built by a tier one contractor. Next. And uh, we didn't learn from outside the country. This was in 2014, next. Uh, the the uh, La Crosse building in Australia, in Melbourne. Next, please. And if you look at that uh, set of balconies, uh, next. This is what it turned out to look at. Uh, after a match and a single uh, a cigarette in a balcony uh, set fire, and the combustible composite cladding, very similar to Grenville, that was seen as a cause of the rapid spread of flame. And uh, next, and it was interesting, I, I'll not go through this in detail, but this was let on a design and build basis uh, without site inspection duties by the design team. And yet uh, in the judgment, the judge found against the architect, the fire engineer and the private sector building certifier as having to pay most of the damage. And reading the last piece there, even though an architect may work for the builder and be employed on a limited commission during construction, it was judged that as a lead consultant, they still bear primary responsibility for the safety of the building. And according to the decision, architects and consultants are required to exercise high standards of professional judgment and skill, even if their commissioning arrangements and fees militate against this. Now, that does raise many questions as to how we all carry out our, our duties and what responsibilities might fall on us. Next. 
part of that design and build issue has been that the design has become separate from the build. And quite often now practices aren't going out to site or carrying out the site inspections that demonstrate the designs are actually being built on site. Next, as part of that process, sorry, next, sorry. As part of that process, you get feedback and learning. Um, but I think our current processes, next, uh, are more like this in that the form of contract and current practices we use don't give that reliable client assurance and nor do they give the feedback, which allows us to, uh, to learn from errors and mistakes and put them right next time. Instead, we just repeat them next. And all of those points uh, are reinforced by Dame Jill's report. The tendency has been to buy things as quickly and cheaply as possible rather than to focus on quality. There is a lack of clarity on roles and responsibilities as just shown in the fragmented nature of the Australian arrangements. The oversight processes aren't working effectively. We are unsure about the competence of those involved and designable contracts and value engineering are often resulting in uncontrolled, undocumented, and poorly designed changes being made to the original design intent. Next. The government has recognized this and responding to DMTO's report says that procurement is pretty much at the start of it and the end of it, and that there's poorly designed tender specification and processes, 11th hour appointments, lack of and broken engagement supply chain or early involvement, and contract forms which prioritize low cost solutions at the expense of safety and quality. Next. So this report um, is really putting forward a set of principles aimed at trying to eradicate those practices and bring them to, together in an integrated way. So the fragmented approach of part inputs by designers and contractors has to be replaced with a coordinated holistic approach um, that allows the safe compliant projects uh, and, and it requires collaborative procurement that will make all participants act collectively and responsibly um, rather than as individuals with only their part responsibilities. Next. This is just a diagram that I, I've used before. And it's a diagram I used for 15 years in a procurement of about 3.5 billion pounds of work. And it meant that everyone worked together in a collaborative way. Um, the contractor was appointed early and with a supply chain having to be named and then sharing their information with the design team and the development of their design um, and the client keeping an interest in the whole process. And maintaining in the design team independent scrutiny of construction and retaining a link between the client and the design team to get that assurance all the time. But yet all three working collaboratively in a way that uh, encouraged good practice. And ultimately these uh, relationships then could feed on to several projects rather than one project. Um, and we find it worked very, 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 very well that early access by design teams to supply chain is increasingly important with technology changes and design teams becoming less and less specialists in some areas. Next. And the traditional model looked like this on the left, um, where we had the button pass form where the client did a brief pass it to a design team, the design team passed it on to a construction team, and then they all left side quickly. Whereas on the right hand side, in the collaborative model that I've shown, um, you bring the architect on earlier, you bring the contractor and his supply chain on earlier, and all three work together right through the whole process and to beyond. I, you can't see at the bottom of the slides, at least I can't, but um, the, the process is there's feedback as well, which is essential to the process, and that so rarely happens under our traditional way of procuring. Next. I just want to focus on uh, two areas. Um, of the report section seven and section eight. Um, uh, David has mentioned these uh, before, so I'll only touch on it very, very briefly, but it is absolutely essential to ensure that the roles and relationships are agreed, particularly in relation to the responsibilities necessary to undertake the requirements of the three new gateways in relation to the level and uh, provision of evidence to, to meet those gateways. Um, it also deals with establishing fair payment terms and cost models. The resourcing of a project is absolutely essential to success. The proper resourcing, otherwise you will get um, people cutting quality. Um, that, that has been a major problem, including 
the appointment of design teams and inspection functions, which have largely been uh, been cut in terms of many projects, the, the, particularly the, the site inspection functions. That's a critical element that must be brought back. Um, it, it talks about transparent decision making and how uh, teams coming together to use joint risk management strategies rather than separate risk management strategies. And they agree the actions and for dealing with each risk. And finally, it has to uh, implement a consultation system to ensure that residents and representatives are notified, discussed and taken into account. Next. Um, section eight uh, looks at information. And I think increasingly we're concerned that there's less information provided before design starts than there used to be. And uh, more design should be, uh, should be produced and will have to now be produced under, the, under Gateway to uh, before build uh, commences. The problem with this is that a lot of work is done by now, design work is now done by subcontractors who are often late appointments and therefore the work is less adequately coordinated with the rest of this project and creates those risks of interfaces. Uh, the uh, use of digital information is uh, something which is now a standard requirement in most major projects and has become more and more standard and in standard formats used across uh, uh, industry. Um, and that then obviously feeds into the golden thread and whole life asset management. BIM is a key model. It needs to be better used, still needs to be made more, more accessible, I think, uh, to a wider group and can be used to improve early supply chain involvement um, processes. It also um, will help that relationship development between the various players. And um, the question is, how do we build that into the collaborative contract arrangements? Next. So the question I asked on the slide I showed at Grenville, who should be looking after quality and safety? All parts of the industry and project participants have a key part to play. And it requires positive collaboration between all parties through a shared and fully understood responsibility matrix, which sets out the roles and responsibilities of all involved and their necessary interactions and interdependencies throughout the length of the project. It needs clear and supportive leadership um, to ensure that the required quality of completed design and construction is delivered. And that's a key extension of the responsibilities of principal designers and principal contractors, but all other participants as well in the project. We need, as an industry, to adopt a new set of standardized quality procedures that will provide evidence, hard evidence of compliance on safety. And uh, an example of this is the RIBS new fire safety compliance tracker, which um, uh, I think it's an excellent document, but there's many more of this type of things have to become standardized in the industry. Most importantly, however, we need properly resourced, trained and motivated teams working collaboratively who no longer view quality as negotiable, but as an absolute requirement. Next. Next. We need to change now. We can't wait, as David said, change is needed now and we need to get on with it. It is too late, unfortunately, for the last tenants of Grenville. Next. Thank you. John, thank you very much indeed for that insightful and sobering reminder of why uh, we've got over 400 people on this call today. Uh, and why we need to be doing something differently. Um, we have some time now for questions and answers. And the first one, Dame Judith, is uh, directed to you, as you may have seen. It says, how will the conflicting roles and title of the principal designer be rationalized under the Building Safety Bill and the CDM regulations and be applied in procurement contracts once the bill comes into effect? And secondly, when is Royal Assent likely to be in 2022 um, I don't know whether you would like to uh, have a first go at that question. Uh, well, thank you, David. I, I, I did see that question in the chat. But first of all, I, I need to understand why people think those roles are conflicting, because that, that kind of cuts across the very principle of what we've all been trying to do for the last four years, which is to develop a consistent approach to what we mean by those things, uh, so that those who are familiar with CDM regulations can read across to similar responsibilities in relation to 
building safety and the safety of residents. So I start from a position of not seeing the two the things as being conflicting at all. And if other people do, then then we need to understand why. In terms of when the bill will achieve royal assent, uh, that's not within my control, but my, my understanding is it's next month. Uh, certainly during May at the very latest. Uh, and, and then there is uh, the, the process will roll on from there. But even at this stage, I don't think anyone should be in any doubt that it's going to happen. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, Richard, who raised that question, if you want to email me as to the uh, discrepancy that you perceive, email me at King's. I'll pass that, that question on for clarification because it's not an easy medium through which to debate it further today. But thank you very much. Um, the next question I, I will pick up, which is, is, is it anticipated through the questions I listed that the building safety regulator will be reviewing contracts and appointments, to which my answer is no. Um, but they could. Um, and most importantly, there are serious penalties for giving inaccurate building information to the building safety regulator. So to my mind, I'm not assuming that people will say things that aren't true or will just submit documents and say, have a look at these. Um, this is a process of due diligence that should be in the hands of clients, designers and contractors who would want to do this anyway, and who are enabled, honestly, to make a complete set of representations to the building safety regulator, whether um, the building safety regulator does spot checks and in what way is, of course, uh, the next question. But, but I think that we're trying to get into uh, the uh, real triangulation of responsibilities through appointment processes and documentations. Um, and I will also take the next one before I share the floor again with Dame Judith and, and with John, which is a question that said, surely the regulator should be looking at design, not appointments. Now, I think both of you may want to comment on this as well. But I will make the point that the building safety regulator is not a shadow designer. They're not, they're not auditing contracts and they're certainly not auditing designs to take people's design responsibility away. Um, the relevance of them looking at uh, appointments as well as at procurement processes is to understand how people have been selected through uh, a qualitative rather than a lowest price approach. Um, who they are um, in terms of contributors through early supply chain involvement, how designs are developed, whether they use digital information management or not, um, and who is brought into the collaborative process, including residents. So to me, if we don't look at that through the lens of contracts, uh, we look at it in a vague way. And, and I think people see contracts very narrowly as administrative and risk transfer tools, and then they wonder why we can't get a clarity of enforcement as regards the obligations we want people to take on. But I, I'm very happy to open that up to, to John and to Dame Judith in terms of should the regulator be looking at designs rather than contracts? Um, I pick that up, David, by all means, because I think, I think the nature of both of those questions speaks volumes for me about the failure as yet for people to really understand how the new regulator will operate. What lies behind this new building safety bill is a shift in responsibility and a shift in that burden of responsibility. The questions people should be asking themselves now at this point is, how am I going to demonstrate to the regulator that I am doing the right thing? Because what the regulator is going to ask is, show me and demonstrate to me that the building you are about to build, the building you propose to build, is going to be built safely. And how can I be sure that the building that you have built is the building you told me you were going to build that we agreed would be safe? And once you start putting those questions in front of people, it seems to me that following this guidance, is the simplest and the most effective way to be able to respond to those questions from the regulators in a way that says, here's why you can be confident we're doing the right thing. Because we have entered into a collaborative arrangement with the designer and the builder, and we are all working 
and to and singing from the same hymn sheet. What is Thank so you. difficult about that? Thank you so much. John, do you want to add anything? Um, well, just essentially that the, the design is absolutely critical, um, of course, uh, but the client has to take responsibility in appointing a design team that, that will deliver an appropriate design, has to demonstrate that uh, that person has a competence. So the process of competence becomes much more significant in terms of the people that are involved. A lot of design isn't actually carried out, unfortunately, by qualified design teams in many situations, and it's something that, that the, this procurement process has, has to look at. Um, I think the issue of inspection then becomes a major issue um, as to the level of inspection that one can expect to have from a, a regulator, from a building um, a pre a control um, officer, um, is not sufficient to demonstrate uh, compliance. And the, the client has to procure, through his procurement process, sufficient processes to ensure that he has the evidence to demonstrate that the building has been built compliantly. And that's why we as an industry have to become much more standardized in the production of evidence. And that be photographic, um, video recording, um, certification by independent professionals of the work being done. That piece of um, investigation and inspection, wherever it's carried out within the organization should be independent to a large degree. Uh, but it also needs to be funded, and it has been cut out in, in, in long term, uh, to a large extent, particularly with the demise of parts of works. We have to get back to really um, looking at the work that has been carried out on site in a detailed way before buildings are closed in. And the regulator can only therefore get that information from others. The evidence requirement will fall back on the client and the people that they procure in order to deliver that evidence. And I think it's a, it's a new dimension that we have to look at in a much more focused way. Thank you. We've got questions flowing in. So um, I'm going to, um, there's, there's, there's one from Lord Aberdare about the need for uh, possible secondary legislation. How, are the, how is the guidance going to be enforced? My view in the first instance is that if it is integrated with the work of the building safety regulator, then we have a functional system uh, through which if you're going to develop and you're going to work through the stages of development, you have to comply with the guidance. This is not, uh, as I say, counterintuitive or unreasonable or uh, narrowing people's uh, ways of working. It is, to my mind, proven common sense. Um, any clarity that can be brought to bear in secondary, secondary legislation um, that would sharpen people's views of this, of course, would be entirely welcome. Um, uh, we feel that we've, we've, we've put um, a collaborative set of important guidelines on the table we've had a good response to it to them um, we uh, Beth Dunning will be talking about engagement with the health and safety executive who are indeed att attendees of this meeting you know there are steps to take but I I take the point that there may be some legislative uh, role there but I want to move to insurance briefly um, uh, which is raised in different ways by many people and I'm well aware in the same way as there's a crisis for mortgage provision, that there's a crisis for insurance, partly coming out of the uncertainty generated by the Grenfell Tower disaster. I don't think we can solve that one today, but my view on insurance is that I would be delighted to see insurers generate new whole project policies, and they do uh, exist. Um, I do not see insurance as a magic wand. And all of the examples that I listed of effective risk management through collaborative procurement did not have the benefit of an extra uh, insurance policy. But again, John, Dame Judith, you may wish to, to add to that because it is something that people feel, you know, can provide them with additional support. Uh, the, the insurance issue is one which is causing probably most concern uh, within the profession certainly in terms of getting adequate cover and many people aren't just getting it at the moment. Um, I think this is an area where government has to step in and become a much more significant player in shaping that market. Um, it's uh, something which, which architects can't do or designers can't do on their own um, and uh, um, I think we, we are sitting in a situation now where things just aren't working from this perspective. 
So um, I, I think there's a major role here for government to get become more involved in looking at the shipping of that industry. Tim Judith, do you want to add? Yeah, I I agree with John up to a point, but I I, I think I think um, the the insurance and indeed the financial sector um, need um, what's the right word encouraging, let's say, to um, be a bit more proactive in this space. Uh, I've made no secret of my frustration with the. Uh, um, We'll sit on the fence until some off, someone offers us a, a solution we can sign up to approach. And certainly it's an area that we on the industry safety steering group are going to be uh, looking at in some detail over the next 12 months, because we do think there is a more proactive and encouraging role that both insurance and the financial sector can play in terms of um, offering new and supportive products to those who are doing the right thing whilst at the same time, perhaps continuing to create um, significant barriers to those who are seeking to get cover, but not make, not willing to make changes to the way they do business. Thank you. I mean, there's another question relating to funders that I won't go into separately, but I have all through my career seen funders as very unimaginative, fixated only with financial close and very reluctant to look at an incremental process of design and risk management, which of course would secure their lending. Um, but yes. they, they are two steps away from the process. And for developers, particularly private sector developers, but also housing associations, who of course are in that same space, um, getting this these processes to operate on a new development has to align with the requisite approvals from funders and the requisite release of funding and and uh, I absolutely agree that we have to get we have to communicate with funders insurers are making a market that helps us or they're not um, funders I think can block the whole business by saying we don't really want to give you any money at all until you have given us a fixed price in a nice single stage tender and that I don't think they fully realize uh, the implications of what they do um, there are, there's a very interesting point from, I think, Ian Hepton, Hepton Stoll, Stoll, sorry, Ian, I know your name well, um, which is the morphing of, of contractors into clients and the, I think, the role of project management. Um, and uh, I think that there is, a, there's, there is a reference to project management roles in the guidance that's client leadership we've talked about and Martin Cawthorn will talk about later. Uh, project managers can be enablers or blockers if they're on really low fees and given really narrow briefs, they can stop all this happening and they can push a, a single stage design and build, big pile of documents, yes or no. Um, uh, and they can, be they can be enabled by the way they engage with clients and they can be more or less imaginative. I, again, it, it, it is, um, there's, there's nothing that stops uh, project managers doing their excellent job with the benefit of the additional tools we've described um but if they if, if it's a profession they're not on board with this they they certainly can uh slow this these changes down again john you are you're referenced in that question what's your view on project management lead as distinct from design lead um i, I think i'd like to maybe not use those terms necessarily but talk about the intelligent customer um and clients have to either be themselves an intelligent customer to know how they will interact and how they will set up relationships with design teams and contractors and build a collaborative spirit. They need to know that uh, themselves or else they then need to bring in um, client advisors um, to act in that role. But they have to stay in touch with the project. And uh, I think too often we get a chain, particularly in design and build, where the design teams step out of the out of the game largely um, and the contractor takes over and you lose that three-party element which i feel is absolutely essential to successful projects uh, that the client has full access to professional advice as well as contractor advice rather than through the contractor all the time and too much design going down the the line to um, sub and sub subcontractors um, who maybe we, we didn't, you might have thought you were appointing a design team to do the design, but an awful lot of it's been done by people you've never heard of or seen. Um, 
So I think that project management role is absolutely critical, but the client has to, the client of these sort of projects has to either be an intelligent customer, um, have that ability to interface in an informed way, or um, procure the services of someone to act in that role, but very much from a client perspective, not from, uh, so the morphing that you talk about, I don't think should be allowed to happen. Thank you very much. Now we need to, to wrap up. So I'm going to give Dame Judith the last word in this session. Um, but I will uh, stimulate the, your whatever you might say with, with a question that expresses the fear that regulation and indeed the requirement for digital technology may impact smaller construction companies and make it harder for new ones to enter the market. Um, I, it's not my view, but it may be that, that there's a question that's been raised with you in the past. Uh, whether it has or not, I'd be very grateful for your closing words in this first half before we move on to additional presentations. Dame Judith. I think the answer to that, in, in my view, is is no, it won't make it more difficult. I think what, what we are all seeking to achieve here, and what I hope we will achieve, is a differentiation between those who, those companies at all parts of the supply chain, who are willing and committed to doing the right thing and to differentiate between those and the ones who seek to cut corners and whose focus is on the short term and on getting the job done for least cost rather than delivering the right outcome. So my hope is that with um, guidance like this in place for procurement, alongside things like the Building a Safer Future Charter process, I think we have a number of mechanisms in place that will not only support the regulation, but will also enable companies of all sizes, large and small, to nail their colours firmly to the mast on whether they're on the side of the angels or otherwise. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I know there are a series of other questions. We may be able to pick those up at the end of the second half, so please be be patient, I will note them down and see if I can uh, answer, answer them. If we could move on to the next slide, please, Francis. Um, I would like to introduce Beth Dunning, who is a senior policy advisor at the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities and has been an absolute rock and dynamo, if you can be both of those things, in uh, helping this guidance see the light of day, right through to the day she rang me in the morning and said, that Michael Gove was announcing it in the House of Commons that afternoon. Um, so uh, anybody who says civil servants are not dynamic and proactive, um, report to me now, um, because Beth is living proof that that is not the case. She's, she's, she's worked very closely with this, and I'm well aware that it is only one of her many responsibilities in relation to, to building safety. So Beth, very glad to hear from you this afternoon. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's very nice. Maybe it, I am the only civil servant that's done out now. I'm just kidding. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. As David says, my name is um, Beth Dunning. I'm a senior policy advisor at DLUG. So that's the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities. So as David said, I do a, a number of, I wear a number of hats. So I um, have the small task of leading the policy in the Building Safety Programme on Industry Oversight and Culture Change. So what does that mean? I cover a broad range of policy areas, including the Industry Safety Steering Group, which we've heard a bit about um, earlier, also the Building and Safe Future Charter, um, a number of different areas. And then more recently, I've been working with David and Russell and the Procurement Advisory Group to publish the guidance that we're all talking about today. Um, so the section that I'm going to cover is how can the guidance support the future building safety regulator? So what I've taken this to mean is what is the direct link between collaborative procurement practices and how duty holders should approach the new building safety regime. And I know there's been a lot of questions already in the chat about that. So hopefully my presentation can help and also what are the specific actions that can assist the marketplace in making submissions to the building safety regular. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. So the building safety bill, I'm sure a lot of you already know about that as a brief bit of context, the building safety bill will make sure that accountability for safety is held throughout the life cycle of a building and that risks are held and managed by the right people. So the aim of the bill is to deliver a more risk proportionate building safety regime where life safety risks are tackled swiftly, but also disproportionate caution and excessive costs are avoided. So we're looking at value in all aspects. However, we've always been quite clear and 
especially in my work, that improved regulation is only the first step towards making long lasting and meaningful change. And to do that, we need visible leadership and collaboration across the industry and significant efforts to build and in some places rebuild competence and capacity and create transparency and responsibility um, central to all decision making across industry and the supply chain. So where does procurement fit into this? Um, so I think we can all identify that a blocker to real change is ambiguous and silo procurement practices, which can be a factor in producing unsafe, low quality building safety outcomes and poor value for money. So we know therefore that those that carry the risks must set the right behaviours and for the client to set a good um, landscape at the start of a project means that this is carried through the entire time. So it's really important that these steps um, are made correctly at the beginning and that safety and quality is a central value in all decision making throughout. So when there's issues like inadequate specifications, a focus on low costs or adversarial contracting, this is when it becomes difficult to produce a safe building and that's why procurement is so important. So it's really important that we're making sure that those that are regulating are looking out specifically for these measures throughout the gateways process um, to help achieve the goal of a safer building. So if we can go on to the next slide. So how are the guidance fits in? It's quite small, but this is part of the guidance that goes through each of the different stages of the project and questions which the duty holder can use to um, prompt themselves as to making sure they're using um, and asking the right questions and also for the regulator as well. So we really think as a department that this guidance will help to establish trusted collaborative partnerships, not just with the client and the contractor, but between the rest of the supply chain as well. So for duty holders and procurement professionals, this guidance provides practical advice on how to apply the principles of collaborative procurement throughout the life cycle of the building. And helpfully, this is in a checklist form of questions for each stage of the project and what can be required at each stage. So if we go on to the next slide, so who can use it? Um, so we think if you're in any of these categories and you're listening today, you should really look to read and follow up on the guidance and also the sections. So it applies to public and private sector clients. So, and their procurement advisors to improve building safety and quality for in-scope projects, that's high risk buildings throughout their procurement strategies, procedures and contracts. But we also think all parties um, in the industry should really look to this guidance and um, see how it links to the building safety bill. So any any person in a duty holder role, so that is the client, principal, designer, designer, principal, contractor, contractor and accountable person. So in refurbishment as well, should you look to use the guidance and the collaborative processes um, around this to help inform, support and integrate the design, construction, supply and operation of all in scope projects. Um, and then also we think the building safety regulator has an important role because this is establishing the culture of how industry will operate going forward and help it to move to safer practices, the regulatory regime. So how is the latter doing this now? So if we move to the next slide, please. So um, what is the department and also the BSR doing now? So obviously the BSR is not fully operational yet. We have to wait for Royal Assent to do that. But HSC have been in the meantime actively promoting this guidance, particularly with client groups and all stakeholder engagement. Today, using as a resource at recent roundtables and when working with wider stakeholders to help improve knowledge and engagement of the new regime and also our department have been promoting it at events and in particular with several local government stakeholders as a step in understanding what is needed from procurement professionals in the new regime so if anyone asks us how do procurement professionals prepare for the future regime we say you should just read this guidance and it's a step-by-step -step guide and also HC recognize this is uh, what good looks like in regard to procurement although as I said they're not yet regulating as as the BSR this document is helpful as it provides us with a resource to help support the building of other resources in the future such as further guidance um, and as David was saying in secondary and um, statutory guidance, we can look to use this as a building block um, as to how we do this and also explaining it um, to clients and those from a procurement perspective. So if we go on to the final slide, so kind of in conclusion, 
as I've said, have been um, it's a useful guide to help those from procurement perspective or anyone in a duty holder role in the new regime to spot the transition to increase collaborative procurement approaches across the sector. I will reiterate what I've already said and encourage everyone to, if you haven't, or I assume you will have if you've come to this event, um, to look to yourselves and encourage your wider networks to promote the use of the guidance is incredibly helpful advice to prepare for the future regime. We think this is a great resource as well as the construction playbook and also what David has been doing on constructing the gold standard. Government would point to this is how we think we can support procurement professionals in the new regime. When we think if it's implemented, it will help to deliver safer and high quality buildings and we'll start to tackle some of the poor behaviors we are seeing across the supply chain. So we encourage you to embed this good practice and ask yourself this question on the final slide, does my procurement process promote collaboration and set the right behaviors from the outset of the project? Thank you, that's me done. Hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Again, we will have questions and answers at the end of this session. I'm sure people will have some for you. Um, people are asking about the slides. Um, we're not going to distribute the slides. We will ask people to read the guidance. Um, what we will do, as I say, is hopefully create a video um, of those presentations that speakers are happy to include on a video, and we will notify you if and when we're able to create that video. But as Beth rightly said, I do urge you to look at the guidance. It is not difficult to, 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 to grasp and it does contain a lot more detail than we're able to cover today. Uh, the other thing I would answer, somebody asked, is this applicable to ex works in existing buildings as well as new buildings? It most certainly is. And I'm glad that question was raised. But now if I could have the next slide, I have the opportunity to hand over to a client, a client that is one of the leading housing associations in the country. And we have Martin Cawthorn, who is their Director of Procurement. Now, he's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. He was an active member of the Procurement Advisory Group. And he's going to talk us through how clients should lead implementation of the new guidance. Martin, over to you. Thanks very much, David. <clears throat> OK, first slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> as the slide says, I'm going to be focusing on the client role in the implementation of the guidance. Next slide. I'm going to be covering leadership, management and quality control, early supply chain involvement, fair treatment of the supply chain using balanced evaluation criteria, collaborative involvement of residents, and managing the whole life digital asset information. A lot, lot, lot of stuff there that you've already heard about, um, but I make no apology for covering the same ground, but this is from how the client can be effective and drive some of these aspects. Um, as we've already heard from John Cole, um, the importance of the sort of intelligent client, um, and the sort of leadership aspect that the, the client has, should have, um, but in, in my experience, uh, certainly in previous lives, sometimes hasn't had in the past. And, and I do endorse sort of John's observation previously of the appearance of a client sort of stepping out of the process. And, and unfortunately I have witnessed that myself in the past. Um, you know, exceedingly frustrating, um, but I think we are getting better at that now, but it's something, again, that we we need to uh, focus on, and the, the client is, is in the front seat, the driving seat, to be able to set the, the tone and the behaviours uh, of everything <clears throat> at the start of the, the project. So we have the, the efficient focus on on improving safety and quality, of course, that's the the main focus um, of the um, of, of this guidance. Um, avoid traditional behaviours. What do we mean by that? Some people who've sort of come to this um, construction sector fairly recently might not recognise those. So some of us who've been around a little bit longer um, will know exactly what I mean by that. 
and will have seen um, the, the symptoms of it. Um, Dame Judith has already used the phrase many, many times, the race to the bottom and the, the adversarial approach um, that uh, unfortunately has bedeviled the, um, the sector for, for too many years. And, and, and what we're about now is, is putting that, bringing that to an end. Um, but it does need everyone, all parties in the process. And I think that's one of the, the encouraging things that I found from being part of the procurement advisory group was I actually found other parties or other representatives of other parts of projects other than procurement um, to actually be of the same mind and, and the same approach. Um, and, and I soon began to realize that it, with all parties um, committed to this approach, um, the, the change that we've searched for for, for so long now um, should and, and must be achievable. In terms of commitment to continuity, for me, partnerships and collaboration are about people. People develop relationships. So my encouragement would be to work hard uh, on a project at keeping the same people involved in the same project. Don't just substitute someone for convenience's sake and, and, and break the, um, <clears throat> the relationships that, that have already been developed. And of course, we need a robust performance management system and an effective system of quality control. You've heard already reference to gateways or hold points um, and the reintroduction of um, a sort of historic or traditional role of clerks of works um, are starting to be reintroduced. Um, and for me, that's, that's a good thing. And, and their, their disappearance or their lessening in the, the sector um, had not had a, a, a positive impact on, on performance. Next, please. Also down to the client is early supply chain engagement, supply chain involvement. So I would encourage all clients to get themselves into a position when they, where they can have a meaningful dialogue with the main contractor, subcontractors and material suppliers as early as possible at the conceptual or outline design stage. These parties can then input to design, costing, risk management and the structuring of the project and they can discuss and agree approaches to safety and quality. It will also open up opportunities to improve value and reduce risks on the project. All of this will be more effective and more implementable the earlier their involvement. We have a project currently running where all parties have been involved right from the start and we are now many months into the project. It was remarked recently that at one of the project meetings that they are getting shorter. And this was put down to the fact that we, there were very few disagreements. It seemed that our thinking across all parts and functions within the project had become very much aligned over the months of engagement. And as a consequence, morale on the project was and is sky high. Next slide. Having been involved in procurement for many years now, um, I'm encouraged to see what I'm terming a, a new approach um, now being more and more widely adopted. This approach involves an acceptance that contracts should be profitable. It recognises that contractors and suppliers need to make a fair return. I'm becoming increasingly confident that this approach will continue to spread amongst practitioners as it becomes increasingly visible and seen as the accepted approach for clients to adopt. Anything else takes us in the wrong direction, introducing the possibility of lower 
substandard quality and increase safety risks. It undermines trust and any potential for meaningful collaboration is lost. Next slide. This new approach to procurement can be seen to focus more on value than cost. But we need to be clear what we mean by value and how to recognize it. Let's focus on outcomes and identify wider value drivers beyond the traditional time, cost and quality. And if we're talking quality, let's also be clear what quality looks like and how we might objectively evaluate quality submissions in competing bids. This is a difficult area and it needs thorough planning and preparation as early on in the project as possible. And participants may need specific training as it is a skill in itself. Next, please. This is an area which doesn't always get the attention it deserves. It's a key part of any project and needs proper planning and resourcing. We need to move on from the traditional preconceptions of what do they know? This is a complex subject that needs specialist knowledge. No, it isn't. Residents know what good looks like, what works and what doesn't work. Then there is the fear of resident engagement will consume significant time and resource and the residents will want to be involved in everything. In my experience, that's not the reality. Their time is valuable too, and they only want to be involved when they can make a meaningful contribution and impact. So plan it well ahead, get meetings in people's schedules and capture and act on the outputs. Feelings of mutual trust and respect will then start to develop between residents and project team members. Next, please. And finally, the subject we all talk about, but, but some still don't seem to fully understand. In simple terms for me, it boils down to, to knowing what's been installed has been done correctly at each stage of the build and what we are having to maintain where applicable on an ongoing basis. Really fundamental, but absolutely vital. The golden thread integrating design, construction and operation. Having worked in other sectors, residential is clearly behind in this area but we need to close the gap as quickly as possible. So I would encourage all clients to embrace an appropriate form of digital information management tool and start capturing the asset data as soon as possible. Thank you. That's all from me, thank you very much. Martin, thank you very much indeed. If I could have the next slide, please. We have two more presentations and then another opportunity for questions and answers and I have been picking up on those in the chat column uh, and identifying some of our speakers who could who could answer them. So I'm very pleased now to introduce Katie Saunders who is a Manchester-based partner in the law firm Trous and Hamlins where once upon a time one upon a, once upon a time long ago I was a partner as well working with her. Um, she is also a board member of the Housing Forum um, and in my experience a specialist in collaborative housing procurement with over 20 years experience. Uh, Katie is going to speak to us about how a procurement and legal advisors should implement uh, the new guidance. Katie, over to you. Thanks David and good afternoon everyone. So as David said, I'm going to spend the next 
well, it was going to be 10 minutes. I'll make it a bit shorter. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of lawyers in supporting and implementing the changes envisaged by Dame Judith Hackett and the legislation. And I think we've all been reminded the serious issue that we are dealing with um, at the moment with building safety and that all of us, in a sense, are implicated in the poor practice that has occurred over many years and that it's all of our duties to uh, improve that. And I do appreciate that lawyers are often seen as part of the problem and in creating adversarial relationships and not properly promoting collaborative working. But as David mentioned, over the last 20 plus years, we have been working at Trowers and personally have been working on collaborative procurement projects, both in the private and public sector, and have experience and track record of documenting those shared visions and objectives into robust legal contracts. And the case studies in the guidance itself are ones that we've worked on. And I'm going to use a quote probably throughout this talk um, from the guidance to translate goodwill into actions. And I think that's really what the overarching role of the lawyer is, is to translate what has been agreed into actions and write that down in legally binding commitments. Over the last two years, we've been advising our clients um, and uh, both in the public and private sectors on how to be prepared for the changes coming into force under the Building Safety Bill and the Act that obviously is imminent. And that includes making sure that their contracts are fit for purpose, but that also they're ready for the changes and that they are already implementing those changes in their procurement and contract practice. So on the next slide, please, thank you. I won't go into the purpose of the guidance because that has already been covered by previous speakers, but I suppose what I wanted to say here is that to some degree the role of the lawyer has actually been made very easy by just needing to follow the guidance and making sure their clients follow the guidance, and that's been in, um, emphasised by Beth previously. And I think there is a role of the lawyer to not be standing on the sidelines in promoting that, but actually to be part of the, the project team, to feel part of the, the construction process, and to take ownership themselves and making sure that happens. Uh, and that's the duty on all of us to be much more proactive in uh, making sure that we write down what has been agreed and challenging clients when they haven't agreed what they should be doing around building and fire safety. So on the next slide, just quickly going to say how we see that happening. And again, it is obviously supported by the guidance. The, the way of translating um, the better translating the guidance into better procurement and contract practice, starting at the, the procurement process itself, inception and procurement, and the selection process. And I think um, Dame Judith Hackett mentioned has mentioned that throughout the guidance and in her reports as well. But how do you do that? One way is obviously looking at alternative pricing models, and these are referenced in the guide uh, and also referenced in the Housing Forum report, Stopping Building Failures, and the Trows White, White Paper on Price Evaluation price evaluation guide. So looking at optimum price models or fixed price models as an alternative to lowest price models. Looking at the assessment of competences against detailed criteria. Again, this is something where the lawyers can help. Again, challenging and checking the clients as to whether they have, as Martin was saying, look, looked at the right criteria and challenged them over that. The um, experience of having a disjointed procurement and construction process, well, this can be changed by looking at a two-stage procurement process where you have a conditional appointment appointing the supply chain early and then moving into agreed design um, and um, supply chain appointments with agreed price um, when you have more detail of the project known. And I'll talk about that when I talk about contracts in a moment. Enabling the early supply chain engagement by providing clients and their, their project teams with the comfort that they can talk to the supply chain early, looking at soft market testing, soft market testing uh, and engagement before commencing a procurement process. And also then signposting the contracts, which clearly set out the roles and responsibilities of the parties. And of course, having a duty to check those roles and making sure that they have been documented properly and that there are no gaps around safety obligations in particular, or indeed duplication, where there's going to be uncertainty uh, and ambiguity. So on the next slide, again, I've listed out the, the checklist, all lawyers like a nice list. So here's a really easy checklist to see whether you've actually done what you should be doing at each stage of the gateway, clearly set out in the guidance. So at gateway one, 
has the client selected fire consultants as professionals based on competency? That's looking at the criteria, the procurement process, but also checking the appointments and service schedules. Are these relevant? Are they appropriate? Are there any gaps? Are there any duplications? A gateway two, looking at the interrogation of the procurement process. Again, looking at the selection, the procurement um, criteria, but also looking at how there is there a transparent decision making process. And again, we can look at that when we look at contracts in terms of looking whether there are core group mechanisms for collaborative decision making, um, alliance boards, and, and a process that means there is open and transparent exchange of information. And at Gateway 3, looking back to see the extent of the collaboration during construction, what about the engagement with the residents? Was that recorded? Was that measured? Um, how was that documented in the contract? And what has been written down about handover fire safety documentation? The golden thread has been mentioned by Martin, obviously by previous speakers, but what was written down in the contract to make sure that was checked on and recorded and of course, looking at making sure that this is a digital um, uh, in, um, record as well. On the next slide, I'm just thought it'd be worth mentioning where the lawyers can help in selecting the form of construction contract. The construction playbook obviously is, supports that they sh you should be looking at standard forms and not reinventing the wheel uh, or creating complicated bespoke forms. So there are obviously many, uh, several standard forms that the, the construction plague but recommends but is agnostic necessarily about which is better but I think you do need to be looking at forms of construction contract that enable early contractor and supply chain engagement that also have integration between each of the gateway stages so there's consistency of team members so there isn't that disjointed process where one team is appointed for preliminary planning and design but a separate team comes in uh, with the contractor's design team, that then means there is a disjointed process. And I think those are obvious points that have been made uh, many times. Having some transparent decision-making process, such as a core group or alliance board, realizing that there is importance of recording what the proactive risk management is, and that that is a joint process and avoidance of design and dump. Martin mentioned the, the getting the careful engagement of residents and key stakeholders and making sure that is recorded within the contract so there's contractually binding obligations to involve those residents uh, to the extent that they want to be and that the client wants them to be involved and supporting BIM which was also pre mentioned by Martin and previous speakers. I haven't put on the slides other elements that you should really be looking for within the form of construction contract but the ability for a project bank account, clear time frames for delivery and the early warning systems in place in order to alert if there are any fire and building safety issues arising during the course of a project. I said there are uh, forms that, that support this and I'm just going to finish on one quick example uh, of where that's been used in practice. So just moving to the, the last slide please. So this was an example where we've been working with a client in the housing Optivo who's a housing association registered provider um, who were very wanted to make a conscious decision that they did not want to repeat any mistakes of the past and wanted to move to a two-stage procurement process using a PPC 2000 contract, which has that two-step process. So built into the contract were the lessons learned in terms of how they were going to make sure there was clear risk apportionment, there was clear design responsibility, that they wanted to make sure there was an open problem-solving hierarchy with a non-adversarial dispute resolution procedure. They want to have a core group to represent the key members of the construction team and to have an early warning system. And also because we were entering into this contract during this, the, whilst the bill was going through parliament, it was anticipating what those building safety roles and obligations would be and who would take responsibility for those if and when the act, well, when the act came into force. I suppose the most important thing on this is the process that was documented under the form of the contract. Uh, and this is where we're trying to change the way that the construction projects have operated in the past, a process, having a process for surveys to be undertaken with contractor involvement and design team involvement, whilst the design is finalised after the known, the known entities of what was needed to be undertaken to that property. The design is finalised alongside detailed pricing, with supply chain members being engaged at that point so they are real prices and then having a agreed risk share and information shared information before commencing works and that was all 
being able to take an under the early stage of PPC 2000, which was a conditional arrangement. So that went unconditional when those price and design were finalized and the supply chain were appointed. So making much more certainty around risk and design and price. So to conclude, what, what can lawyers do? Um, well, first of all, not be bystanders, be proactive in this process, promote collaborative working, build on examples of best practice in the past. And I said, use that quote again, translating the goodwill into actions by actually recording obligations in a legally binding commitment and setting those down in a robust form of contract. Thank you. Katie, thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted that we still have um, over 370 delegates online and uh, that we're telling this story from, from different angles. You will have opportunities to raise questions with Beth and with Martin and with Katie, and also with our final speaker, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, John Welsh, who is Deputy Director of Constructing of Crown Commercial Service, I beg your pardon, a, a fellow of the RICS, um, and a, a leading figure in an organization that has develop very sophisticated collaborative frameworks. So he's going to look at the strategic potential for learning um, and sharing that learning. Um, his frameworks uh, address BIM and digital information management. They also address ongoing repair, maintenance and operation with an option to run on after the completion of the capital phase for seven years. I hope that CCS clients pick up on that option. And I also would say that CCS have worked with the Department for Leveling Up Homes and Community Housing and Communities um, in uh, the housing sector and particularly in relation to um, building safety measures. Um, so, John Welsh, I hand over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us. That's great. Thank you, David. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Good, great, thank you. Always worth checking. So yeah, good afternoon, everybody. As David says, I'm Deputy Director of Construction at Crown Commercial Service. So hopefully we'll talk to you uh, today around how we've looked to implement the guidance. Um, I, I guess with it through Crystal Ball to a degree because it's only just been published, but the reality of what we've tried to do is based on experience is build in uh, the, all of the collaborative ways of, of how we think um, building uh, or procuring buildings from a safety perspective needs to be done. Uh, so if we can have the next slide, please, or the, the next one after that as well. Thank you. So where are we currently then? So progress has been made, obviously, as we've heard across several areas since Dame Judith um, initially published her findings in the report four years ago. And CCS, um, very early on, uh, went and presented to the Industry Safety Steering Group about what we were trying to do to help implement those recommendations. We worked collaboratively um, on those points and designed specific lots for uh, high rise in both our construction and professional service commercial agreements. So it would give us and departments direct access to sector specific suppliers uh, working clearly directly in this high risk sector. Uh, we also held um, very early on uh, with DH or D or MHCLG as it was then, but D look now and um, policy experts in with our high rise suppliers, but also construction management suppliers as well, who clearly have uh, a huge role to play in these types of scenarios uh, in just thrashing out exactly how we could bring to life and practically apply the policies that were being considered on the basis of the findings in uh, the Hackett report. Um, so the frameworks that we've procured also align to construction playbook, um, as well as the recommendations within the, uh, the recent report constructing the gold standard that's been mentioned today. So an attempt to aim uh, improvements around value and of course, reducing risk. And um, David mentioned before, um, we were part of the procurement advisory group as well when it was initially set up. So pleased to, to play a part in the production of the guidance, but, I think it's it's worthy of note, despite the efforts that we've gone to, um, it, it's still not easy to tackle this. Um, there are still barriers, so more needs to be done and more, and more can be done as well. If we can just flip to the next slide, please. Thank you. So there are obstacles and barriers in the way that we see still make it difficult to produce 
um, a safe building. So we still see reluctance in our industry to truly adopt collaborative practices. So there is a tendency to stick with what clients know and what they're familiar with and, and of course what they've done before. Um, specifications as well can be poorly designed uh, and drafted without the right focus on safety quality and of course regulatory compliance. Um, there's too little or late engagement actually with supply chain. So it makes it quite difficult to plan appropriately. We've seen and heard today the benefits of early supply chain involvement. Um, and still too often, we don't see enough of this. Um, poor contract selection as well. So that doesn't really help support collaborative practices um, and it can lead to adversarial relationships. We've had a lot of questions on insurance as, as David talked about before and I was kind of desperate to jump in because actually insurance is what it says. It's, it's an insurance policy. Um, but I may sound particularly naive at this point, but the reality is if, if we did everything we were supposed to do to so the correct regulations uh, and the correct standards, then we wouldn't need insurance to support us. There's too much focus as well on cost instead of trying to drive for quality and, and better outcomes. Uh, and of course, the focus on transferring risk down the supply chain is still too much. Um, you know, there's loads of potential there for, for grounds for, for claims and disputes, etc. unfortunately. Um, and of course, we still see it today in this industry where organisations, uh, you know, are struggling financially. And that's largely because they take on too much commercial risk. So the next slide, if we can flip on, we'll look at how frameworks can help drive some value um, in line with the guidance that is just, well, is, is, has now been launched and is today, but of course, uh, with a lens on the building safety bill itself. So I wanted to sort of draw out actually across each of the gateways, how this can be achieved. So strategic collaboration can help embed improved safety. So at Crown Commercial Service, our frameworks in construction anyway, there's four categories that I lead, are all based on um, Framework Alliance Contract 1. So FAC 1, and this can help promote longer term collaborative relationships on multiple projects or single programs. Uh, it fosters great mutual trust as well, um, facilitates the sharing of knowledge and information, generates and embeds improved approaches, approaches sorry, to safety and quality and design construction and importantly in the operation and occupation uh, of each project um, and a framework alliance in our context really does help digital integration um, joint risk management as well and really importantly sharing in success so we generate uh, mutually agreed success measures and um, objectives uh, against clear timelines and action plans as well to help customers and supply chains work closer together and just on that point, it does drive greater supply chain collaboration. Um, so at the right times as well, though, both horizontally and vertically in our supply chains, um, it can bring in sort of MMC specialists as well, uh, which we know as a, as a market, certainly from a manufacturing perspective, can help improve safety as well. Um, and frameworks that we have and we manage, we, we really do have a focus on supplier assurance. Um, so at the forefront of ensuring that suppliers have the right capability and expertise to deliver against the requirements. Our frameworks significantly enable the opportunity for early supply chain involvement. So where a customer or a department may come and speak to us, um, we actively encourage them to start engaging the market sooner than they had originally have thought. Uh, so we, we offer to host sort of market events as well. Um, the construction playbook talks about three different approaches to early supply chain involvement, but I think really critically, um, the market engagement, early market engagement to start setting strategies um, is not used as great as I think is what it should do or should be. The price element within uh, our construction frameworks has been evaluated on an optimum price basis. Um, so it promotes sustainable pricing rather than that more traditional race to the bottom, which we've touched upon today. Um, and within our specifications, we set clear obligations that the supplier alliance members and the representatives promote and deliver and communicate transparency of all of their pricings and, and of course, opportunities where they can help uh, create value as well. Our framework models uh, or the model form uh, promotes collaboration and joint risk management and does importantly include early warning mechanisms, um, but also risk reduction mechanisms as well. We promote the opportunity to create joint risk registers 
uh, each party is is equally as responsible at any phase of a project so let's not talk about it in that way and develop the right risk uh, registers and, and the right mitigations to go with them as well uh, and it includes the ability for users to select the right collaborative procurement method so whether their requirements require a sort of two-stage d and b or a cost-led procurement approach um, definitely early supplier involvement of course and insurance backed alliance thing as well i think it was referenced before in the, in the QA or integrated project insurance, it's also known as. Um, and when departments need to use our agreements, they have the option for evaluating their, um, their bids in a particular way. So our default is um, to have a 75-25 split, so 75 quality, 25 price as well, to try to ensure a better balance in that regard. And finally, we are a corporate member of Building a Safer Future Charter. Uh, so we're working in partnership with BSF and with SCAPE as well uh, and supporting our suppliers to become champions uh, of the charter itself. So we've seen some fast approaches to uh, uh, our suppliers wanting to be part of this and, and we're happy to support those uh, in that journey as well. So just finally then to summarise on the final slide, um, the guidance mirrors the commitment in the government's construction playbook. Uh, it's important to drive the change through the gateways that it talks about and the in particular the, the prompted questions that are so useful uh, and of course it requires us to use the recommended procurement and contractual systems uh, which hopefully clients wouldn't opt out of um, there's still lots to be done though uh, we know there is and um, but actually i think collectively we can play a huge part as leaders in our industry and just take that challenge so, you know let's step up and, and start to make things happen let's not wait for the bill to come through in a couple of months let's start to act now because it's going to be too late by the time the regulations and legislations come in so thank you david thank you john and thank you to everyone who is still with us again really impressive numbers i'm going to we have a number of questions in the chat column i'm just selecting one for each of our four speakers um so the first one beth is for you um what do you think is the extent of the competency gap between where we are now and where we'll need to be to comply with the building safety bill? So yeah, that's an interesting question because I think it really differs from sector to sector and um, working alongside the competent steering group, which is the group of professionals that have been looking at this, it's quite apparent that in some cases we are needing to build competence levels up to the level that they should have been pre grandfather not even to meet the requirements of the new building safety bill. So I think there is going to be a lot of work, but there's been a lot of work in trim with industry and also we're developing standards um, with BSI for the key roles um, in the new system. But I think it will be a learning curve in a number of areas and also um, capacity as well. I know it's a big, a big issue for certain key roles. Um, fire risk assessors, fire engineers. So I think it's um, not just the competence we need to be thinking about as well, it's whether there's enough people to be carrying out the roles that are required as well. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful um, that we can get, kind of get there with the, with the HSD as well and the expertise in this area, but it's going to be um, quite a, a steep learning curve for, for some in industry to to get to the level that they, they should have been pre grandfather never mind, to meet the regulations that we need now. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. A, a balanced answer in terms of it is accessible, but it's not a piece of cake. People need, uh, you know, they've been given a lot of guidance on how to take these changes seriously, but it's not an overnight process. Uh, Martin, I, I'd like to turn to you next. There was a question around client leadership in the development of a shared protocol for information management to make sure that BIM is properly adopted or its equivalent and, and covers the whole life of a project. What do you think is the client's role there? Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm aware, I'm, I'm not aware of the, the exact detail, but we are, um, LNQ are part of a, a sort of group sort of that, that are actively encouraging organizations to to adopt the the BIM approach so uh, uh, for me I think there's a there is a leadership role and setting an example 
Um, so that, and that's certainly what uh, what Alan Q are trying to do in this area, as as sort of caveating that with qualification that others have also suggested. Again, this is not an easy area, um, you know, and and it's it's quite new, in my my from my perspective to the sector. Although some areas have been talking about it, but we are we we are in a catching up mode, and and we need to try and accelerate the process and help people understand what it involves and also what the benefits are, because I think again they aren't completely. Uh, apparent to everyone so I, I think there's a there's a leadership and a an informing role as well to to help the development of this as as we go forward you get a supplementary question because uh sarah rock with whom i've had the pleasure to work in the past uh said there's a particular problem in handing over bim information uh, after completion of construction and she alluded to mandating the use of digital twins that isn't going to be my question. My question is going to be, um, is it worrying for people that the language keeps changing and that the international standard for BIM 19650 brings in so many different terms? Um, or if to use the BBC approach, how worried should we be? Um, Martin, do you, do you see BIM as sufficiently accessible or do you feel it's a little bit shrouded in mystique? I think I think it's still a bit shrouded in mystique. Um, as, as I said, I, I mean, I, I I do see people sort of, you know, making comments that suggest they really don't fully understand it. Um, and and so what we're trying to do is to help them with that. In in terms of different references and technology terminology, um, that cannot be helpful. Um, you know, it's understand why that's happening, um, but. Um, you know, if you get someone comfortable with particular terminology and, and what that them understanding what that truly means, then then to take them out of that almost comfort zone with some new terms uh, is not going to help the the speedy implement adoption and implementation of of um, you know of the the mechanism. Um, so the sooner we get to a sort of standard message references terminology um the whole nine yards the the better and i think that will facilitate a, a speedier adoption um throughout the sector thank you if, if sarah was entitled to speak she'd have things to say on that but i do feel that the the enthusiasm for bim sometimes takes people further away from prospective users i'm going to answer a question have users of collaborative contracts seen a measurable in re reduction in construction disputes uh, Richard Harrison, how about zero in uh, all pro housing projects that are referenced as examples in the guidance? Zero disputes, and I can vouch for that because I've had some connection with all of those projects. This is a really good question um, uh, because disputes reflect waste, defensiveness, uh, the wrong culture. Um, a measurable reduction to zero is what I can offer you. Um, turning to Katie Saunders, there's a question around the way of bringing in suppliers. Suppliers and manufacturers are essential to building safety for reasons we all know. Um, just uh, reiterating or adding to Katie, the, the way of selecting and incentivizing uh, tier two suppliers through early supply chain involvement. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, I was hoping you were going to ask me the question about the the disputes and I was going to give the same answer as you so <laughs> but I I think we yeah in terms of um encouraging su supply um, tier two into the, the the tier one relationship um two elements there one is obviously the incentive of being at the top table I suppose to be able to shape decisions and be part of the core group and decision making process is is a powerful you know tool because then they're able to determine to some degree their own destiny but also are able to shape and influence the way that the design and um, uh, development um, it pans out uh, and also gives them that security in terms of uh, pipeline of work or the comfort that they are on the project on board which means they can therefore commit more to that project in the security that they're not going to be dumped you know in favor of a cheaper option somewhere later down the line so it's it, the incentive of bringing obviously the suppliers in earlier it is is apparent in terms of how you do that of course there's there's two stages in terms of procurement you can procure your tier one contractor 
at an early stage at that point you can work with that tier one contractor to then for them to suggest the elements of their supply chain they'd like to bring on board uh, and work through a sort of joint approval selection process together uh, which means that they can bring those um, other supply chains and subcontractors on board uh, in a joint selection process which again is is beneficial to the whole team thank you very much katie much appreciated um, there was a question around a balance between design and build and traditional designer-led procurement. Uh, that probably was my fault. Uh, I talked about a single stage design and build. I, I think we have to distinguish the warranty. Are we asking a contractor to warrant design, which is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, from the process of uh, appointing any party, whether a, a lateral team of consultants and contractors or a, a contractor behind whom there is a team of designers, how do we appoint them? How do we engage with them? How do we manage risk? So I don't think we should allow ourselves to confuse the, the design and build stroke multiple party warranty with uh, collaborative procurement processes. But I have the last question for you, John Welsh, which is Ian Hepton style was asking that it, how evaluation processes can get very bogged down in what he described as over the top bureaucracy, which you know, is, is intended to be precise but actually gets in the way of evaluation of the important issues. How have you seen at Crown Commercial the um, evaluation process kept under control, if you like, in order to ensure that you get to the important issues? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I've definitely seen over the years that um, evaluation has been diluted um, because when you bring in multi-party teams, I guess, um, then the, the relevance to them is more important than anybody else's. So as a procurement expert, you have to try and satisfy those priorities, but, but be respectful of um, actually trying to achieve something that is of value and is of, of use. Um, so from a Crown Commercial perspective, uh, we've focused uh, very largely on um, those types of questions. So I think Susanna mentioned something before in the chat around the... Um, uh, the common assessment standards. So if you split your prequal away from your um, evaluation questions for, or award questions, then, you know, we try and we try and do that in the right way. So the standardized approach to evaluation from a, a, an SQ or selection questionnaire and a prequal is done. So using common assessment standard, um, which is the right thing to do. Um, so avoids duplication and, and just allows people to spend greater time on their award questions as opposed to the SQ prequal bit but from an award question perspective and um, we've got to clearly got to evaluate um, certain critical areas but actually this is around competence and capability so as opposed to asking for um, multiple case studies or um, multiple times in a particular scenario for a bidder to satisfy or evidence their experience in particular sectors then try and reduce that significantly um, so actually, if there's if there's one or two examples where the bidder has the opportunity to um, commit to, I guess, a client sort of case study with approvals in that regard, then then do that as opposed to trying to ask and break that type of question down into five or ten different elements. Uh, and you might follow a REBA stage process, or you might follow like an APM uh, Association of Project Management type process. Um, but actually what are you trying to ascertain here? Is it a whole or is it parts of the whole? Uh, and be really, I guess, forthright in, in your decisions in doing that because the question is 100% valid. The more questions that we ask, the more diluted actually um, the score's going to be. John, thank you very much. Now we, we're, we're drawing to a close. I would like to express my thanks again to Baroness Deborah Bull, to Dame Judith Hackett, who you will see has stayed with us for the entire period. She's found uh, two hours in her very busy schedule. Um, she didn't stop with her independent review. She remains highly active uh, and very much at the centre of this reforming process. But she, like we, need uh, all of you to, to drive it. Please, please read the guidance. Um, it is there for you and for your benefit. Um, and um, please think about how you can apply it. For those of you who've requested um, the video, we hope that we will be able to share that through YouTube, but we have to consult with the speakers and make sure everybody is happy. 
uh, thank you again very much to the delegates for turning out in such numbers and for raising so many interesting questions and comments and, and I wish you all the best for the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Cheerio.